some of the things that we've listened to already in this conference, well, I think they deserve to be historic. That's how widely we ought to be sharing. Anyway, I'd like to hand over the mic for a couple of minutes to former Senator John Coulter. And then, as I said, after that, Bernard will be talking about the app. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> I thought this was too good an opportunity, having so many people here, not to say something about the ABC and its total lack of coverage of MMT and anything to do with alternative economics. I have written to Geraldine Doog, I've written to Fran Kelly, I've written to all of them, and you get a complete blank. And the other, the other uh, night you will have st seen um, uh, Philip Lasker commenting on whether the bushfires would increase or decrease GDP. What a marvellous opportunity to explain the defects in GDP because the costs of the bushfires will be added to GDP and Scott Morrison in a few months' time will say, look, you've never had it so good. GDP has gone up. Now, please, all of you, write to the ABC and see if you can get some of the stuff that's been dealt with in this conference into the ABC. It is, after all, your ABC, not theirs. Right. Ooh. I just wanted to say a few words uh, prompted by the, the questions that come up after speakers. Of course, most people can't put their question because we don't have time. However, the app that you will get de or have details on in the program does have a place where you can put any questions or comments. It's called Conference Forum. It's one of the tabs. And what the, the aim of the app overall was to facilitate as much communication between those who are present as possible, not just at the event, and in, or po but also post the event. So those who've registered themselves, put their picture up hopefully, will be able to communicate directly with each other, and anyone can with, you know, remove themselves. So there's no sort of, you know, you're not being monitored by being present on the on the app, but Stephen and I or, or the committee will discuss a little bit what we might be able to do with any questions or comments that are put, which end up being posted on a website effectively, um, that we could you know, pursue in terms of a forum to, for discussion with each other and hopefully sustain and develop relationships that are starting here. So do think about that. If you do have a question and you can't put it here, you can put it through the app on the, on the website. Thank you. Oh, conference forum? The one that says conference forum. Okay? Thank you. It's there. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Bernard. Um, yeah, Bernard certainly. I should just add that things are changing. John Coulter is entirely right, and I have felt some of the time that we have been more or less banned from our national public broadcaster, but things have changed a little bit lately, I think, and in the right direction. Um, Bill has been on a couple of times. We both were on a radio national program called Future Tense recently, but we, the ABC, as far as I'm concerned, has got a long way to go in terms of uh, being open to alternative economic ideas. Uh, actually, Peter Martin is one of the people who uh, uh, Peter Martin and Gigi Foster did uh, interview Bill recently, and Peter Martin was on the Future Tense program. Not well, We were interviewed at different times, but he was on that program as well. If you go on the uh, Radio National site, uh, I guess that show is, is still up there. Um, absolutely, yes. Thank, thanks very much. But it is true that you won't, generally speaking, find anyone with remotely our opinions on Q&A, for example. So where there are large listenerships, which is what some of these ideas, not me, but people like Bill Mitchell deserve to be on. <laughs>
that program because people out there deserve to hear these ideas, which is one reason, of course, why we've organised this conference in the first place. But I might talk about that a little bit more when we finish tomorrow, kitchen table conversations and all that, because we have to spread some of these ideas, if we possibly can, at least an awareness of them and give people an opportunity to, to, uh, to learn about them and, and think about them and ask questions. Now, it's time for us to move on to our last speaker of the day. Um, the, uh, the last speaker today is Associate Professor Philip Lorne, who was a colleague of mine for a long time at Flinders University, who was my PhD supervisor, actually, at that university, and who is my closest colleague and one of my closest friends. And again, I'm going to be ridiculous and tear up if I'm not uh, careful about this, because Phil has put his life and soul and I think it's fair to say has compromised his career by not following the mainstream. And he's put an immense amount of work, unpaid work, into being one of the pioneers of an alternative, um, far superior to GDP, measure of the impact on people's well-being of economic activity and activities which are often not regarded as being economic because they're not paid for. I'm not going to talk about the genuine progress indicator. I'm going to pass over to him to talk about his work on the genuine progress indicator. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Associate Professor Philip Lorne. Please give him a round of applause. Thanks, David. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a bit about what Steve just said, uh, the genuine progress indicator, and I'm going to show you some, pre uh, some pre uh, preliminary uh, results of uh, GPI studies uh, that I've done in Australia, USA, Japan, and China. Uh, I've done some other uh, sort of uh, basic uh, studies of other countries, but I need to hone those results. But my aim, ultimately, is to calculate the genuine progress indicator for every country on Earth. Um, it ta I, I've got to the point where I can do a GPI, as it's affectionately known, uh, for a country in three days. But there's 180 countries on Earth, so that's 540 days. So it, uh, it uh, takes some time. It will take some time. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I need some resources to be able to do that, and I don't currently have them. So uh, if anyone's interested in, <laughs> in providing resources for me to do that, uh, I'd, be, uh, I'd be welcome to, uh, to receive some of those resources and finish the job off, because I really do believe that the genuine progress indicator, which in the past has been calculated on an ad hoc basis, will really get the publicity that it deserves if it's done at the global level uh, for every country. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a bit about gross domestic product, what gross domestic product is, GDP. Uh, I'm going to talk about why GDP is an inadequate indicator of economic welfare. It's actually a useful indicator of one thing, and I'll talk about that, but it's not a very good indicator of economic welfare. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the genuine progress indicator and how it's measured. Uh, I'm going to show some of these uh, GPI results that I've come up with and then talk a little bit about how you might combine that with a thing called an ecological footprint to assess the sustainable development performance of a nation. So what is gross domestic product GDP? You've heard a bit about it, but uh, you perhaps don't know exactly what it means. Basically, GDP is a monetary measure of the final goods and services produced within a country. So GDP measures what a country produces, not what it consumes. Now, if you want a good measure, of national production, monetary measure of national production, look no further than GDP. It's ideal. So we don't want to reject GDP overall, or altogether. But GDP, uh, in its estimation of uh, production, quite rightly, emits intermediate goods that serve as inputs into final goods and services. So what do I mean by intermediate goods? Well, consider a brake pad that's produced by a company that's then sold to another company as an input uh, to the production of a car. That brake pad will not be included in GDP because it will be included in the value of the car as a final product. So the brake pad is an intermediate product and so it won't be included in GDP at that point, but it will be included later on 
in the finished product of the car. There are, well, there are exceptions, and the exception is where an intermediate good is exported. So if that brake pad is made in Australia and then it's exported to somewhere else in the world, which then is used as an input into the manufacture of a car somewhere else in the world, it will be included in Australia's GDP because it's a final product for Australia. Remember, GDP measures what a nation produces, not what the world produces. Okay, so an intermediate product that's exported will be part of that country's GDP if that intermediate product uh, uh, or good is used in a finished product produced in that country where the intermediate product was produced, it won't be included in that GDP at that point, but will be in the final product. Okay, so intermediate products or goods aren't included in the GDP of, of the country where the final product is produced, but will be included in the GDP of the country where it is an input into a final product uh, somewhere else in the world. Uh, GDP is typically used to indicate our economic welfare. What is econo economic welfare? Well, it's basically the difference between the benefits and costs of all forms of economic activity, formal and informal. What do I mean by formal and informal? By formal, well, the formal economy, I guess I'm talking about uh, those uh, aspects of the economy or economic activity where cap which are captured by national accounts. So unpaid forms of work, which are not included in the national accounts are part of what we might call the informal economy and are not included in GDP, but they're included in the genuine progress indicator. Right, so economic welfare is basically sum of benefits minus sum of costs. It's quite basic, really, uh, which is quite interesting because uh, you'd be uh, interested to know that there's no national statistical agency anywhere in the world that is measuring economic welfare at the macroeconomic level. There is no statistical agency that measures benefits, subtracts the cost to estimate the economic welfare of a country. Uh, strangely, from an economic point of view, I've just referred to uh, the fact that the GPI is a, a macroeconomic measure of economic welfare. Microeconomics, which is, Herman Daly talked about uh, microeconomics uh, yesterday, which is not necessarily about small things, but about part of the larger whole. Uh, microeconomics is all about benefits minus costs. But for some reason, when we get to the macroeconomic level, it's just more is better. There's no question as to whether or not that more is increasing benefits more than it's increasing costs. More is just considered better. Right, so there's um, an anomaly between how economists deal at the microeconomic level and how a lot of them deal at the macroeconomic level. GDP is a poor measure of economic welfare. I mentioned that it's a very good measure of, a monetary measure of the production of final goods and services. Why is it a poor measure of economic welfare? Well, the main reason why it's a poor measure of uh, economic welfare is, is because it was never designed to be a measure of national economic welfare. So there's no surprise, it should be no surprise that it's a poor measure of economic welfare. It's meant to be a measure of production. The GDP doesn't count all benefits. So if a measure of economic welfare is going to measure all benefits and all costs, whether they be part of the formal or informal uh, economy, uh, GDP has a problem because it only measures benefits and costs. And as we'll soon see, some of the costs are actually added rather than subtracted that are part of the formal economy. So the GDP doesn't count all benefits. Uh, you could also argue, and I'll put up some of the, the items that make up the benefit and cost items that make up the GPI soon, that the GPI doesn't include all benefits, but it does a much better job at capturing as many benefits as possible and costs. Um, okay, so another thing that GDP does, now I'm, I'm going to actually uh, talk about this a little bit differently to the way I've got it written here, because I'm going to assume that we're using, or we're thinking about using GDP as a measure of economic welfare. Because if we're doing that, then we're saying that we're assuming that GDP is doing a very good job at capturing something, and by me saying why it's an, in, in, an inadequate measure of economic welfare, I'm saying, as much as we're making that assumption, uh, that it's uh, doing a good job of doing something, it's not doing that at all. So, GDP ignores the impact uh, that a changing distribution of income has on the welfare contribution of consumption. So part of GDP is 
uh, includes the goods and services that we purchase that we then consume. Uh, the welfare contribution of consumption, the benefits we get from consuming goods and services, depend very much upon how much you've already consumed. So if you're a wealthy person, you've already consumed a lot. So an extra, say, $100 worth of consumption for a wealthy person doesn't add much to that person's well-being. An extra $100 of consumption adds a lot to a poor person's well-being because they haven't consumed a lot to start with. So let's imagine that uh, GDP doesn't change from one year to the next, uh, but uh, the rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer, and as a result, the rich are consuming more of the same GDP and the poor are consuming less, then the welfare of the rich will have not gone up very much, but the welfare of the poor would have gone down a lot. So overall, the welfare contribution of total consumption will have fallen, even though total consumption as part of GDP will have not changed. Right? The GDP obviously makes no adjustment for changes in the distribution of income over time and therefore changes in uh, the distribution of consumption over time. The GPI makes an adjustment, as we'll soon see. Uh, the GDP counts expenditure. So when I talk about uh, expenditure on consumer goods, of course there are non-durable goods, food, drink, petrol, so forth, and of course there's expenditure on consumer durables. GDP, if we're assuming we're going to use it as a measure of economic welfare, we would be assuming that it's counting expenditure, current expenditure on consumer, consumer durables as a current welfare benefit when the benefits from a consumer durable are enjoyed over the lifetime of its use. So if we use GDP, when we, uh, and part of that is expenditure on consumer durables, I walk into an electrical store and I buy a $1,000 TV set, Okay. If we use GDP as a measure of current economic welfare, we're assuming that we're getting an immediate $1,000 benefit. That's what we're doing. Of course, we don't get an immediate $1,000 benefit. If the television set lasts for about 10 years, then we're going to enjoy about $100 worth of benefits per year for the next 10 years. Right. Those future benefits are not counted in future GDP, even though we enjoy benefits over... Uh, those uh, future or during those future years. So there's a timing issue with respect to when we enjoy the welfare benefits of consumer durables, which the GDP doesn't take into account. You might say, why doesn't it take it into account? Because GDP is a measure of production. That $1,000 is measured in GDP now because basically it reflects the value of production in that particular year where the television was purchased, $1,000. So GDP is doing its job, if it's a measure of production. As a measure of economic welfare, it's not. Uh, GDP ignores the welfare benefits generated by the existing stock of consumer durables. Uh, it ignores the welfare benefits yielded by a TV purchased in the past that's still in use. So if you purchase your television that you have at home last year, Okay, uh, you go home and you turn the television set on. You're enjoying benefits from that television set. That's not included, or won't be included, in this year's GDP. Right. For good reasons, if GDP is a measure of production. Because you purchased it last year when, presumably, last year it was produced. But you're getting those benefits this year. GDP doesn't take that into account. Um, in the same manner as D, GDP counts additions to service yielding infrastructure as welfare benefits when the welfare benefits are enjoyed over the lifetime of the infrastructure. So, uh, $10 million spent on a new road does not equate to an immediate $10 million welfare benefit. Again, why is the full value $10 million uh, spent to build a new road included in GDP? Because GDP is a measure of production and that was the amount that was spent on the road to construct the road in that particular year. But of course, we, in that particular year, in fact, during the year in which it was constructed, there were probably no benefits from that road. It was only after the road was constructed that you start to enjoy the benefits. That's ignored in future uh, measures of GDP. In the same manner as E, uh, GDP ignores the welfare benefits generated by existing infrastructure. 
Uh, so if this lecture theatre is a form of infrastructure uh, and we're using GDP as a measure of economic welfare, we're currently not in... And this, because this lecture theatre was built about five or six years ago, we are not currently enjoying any benefits from this lecture theatre if we're using GDP as a measure of economic welfare. That's not counted in... won't be counted in this year's GDP. It, is, it will be counted in this year's GPI. So, yes, yeah, so the... Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so GDP counts additions to the capital stock, and by the capital sto stock I'm talking about plant, machinery and equipment and so forth, as welfare benefits, yet capital goods don't generate welfare benefits directly. The benefits from capital goods are enjoyed by way of the consumption goods they help to produce. So we produce machines to produce tomorrow's goods. That machine, if we built it this year, will be part of this year's GDP, because GDP is a measure of production. But if we stuck that machine in the corner of this room and never used it, it's not going to generate any benefits in the future. It's only when we use that machine in future years to produce goods and services that generate benefits that we enjoy the benefits of that machine. But the benefits come from the value of the consumption goods that are, in, that, that, that are yielded or generated by the use of that machine to produce uh, those consumption goods over time. Uh, so, the, uh, the value of the machine produced in a particular year is included in GDP, but doesn't actually add to our well-being this year, it adds to our well-being in the future, but is captured, uh, as we'll see in the GPI, in a measure of consumption. GPI doesn't count the value of capital goods that are produced. And you might say, well, why isn't, isn't that ignoring the benefits of capital goods? No, the value in the capital goods come in the, by way of the consumer goods that it helps to generate in the future. Okay? When we produce capital goods, we deprive ourselves of consumption, consumption benefits. Okay? It's, the, it's the price we pay uh, when we deprive our, uh, when we produce capital goods, the price we pay is to deprive consumption today to have consumption into the future. Uh, GDP ignores many social costs. So, um, for example, we could have a situation where the GDP on a per capita basis stays the same from one year to the next and everything else stays pretty much the same, but the unemployment rate goes up and there's more people with uh, suffering from mental illness and so forth. Uh, the GDP doesn't take account of that mental illness cost. I mean, it, it may well be that as a result of the increase in uh, levels of men mental illness, there's an increase in production to deal with people with mental illness, in which case the GDP goes up and we seem to be better off when in fact we're worse off, but uh, if we just assume that uh, per capita GDP stays the same and the unemployment rate goes up, the GDP makes no allowance for that as a measure of economic welfare. GDP ignores many environmental uh, costs, such as the cost of non-renewable resource depletion, cost of deforestation, land degradation, excessive water use, uh, cost of various forms of pollution, and the cost of greenhouse gas emissions. And the other thing about GDP is that a lot of what we produce are defensive and re rehabilitative forms of production. They are not welfare increasing, but welfare maintaining. And the other important thing too is that the, um, uh, the value of these defensive and rehabilitative forms of expenditure or production are in fact rising. Now they're rising because generally GDP is rising, but they're also rising as a percentage of GDP. And they're rising partly because of all these rising social and environmental costs. In fact, when it comes to climate change, there's a lot of talk about how we're going to adapt to a warmer world. The forms of production that we undertake will be defensive or, and or rehabilitative forms of expenditure that hopefully maintain our well-being, but they don't add to our well-being. They'll be included in the GDP because it's a form of production, but they, they should only uh, be included in the GPI if they add to our well-being, but basically, at best, all they do is ma maintain our well-being. So when all is said and done, GDP is basically just a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. No, it's a means to an end. Uh, and it's just one means to achieving only some of a range of social ends and goals. So, you know, one would have to concede that relatively healthy levels of GDP are necessary to live a good life. But once reasonable levels of GDP are reached, human betterment, and 
qualitative improvement, as, as Herman Daly talked about uh, yesterday, doesn't require further GDP growth, and we've known that for some time. So with regards to economic welfare, not production of goods and services, which is where GDP is a very useful indicator, GDP, in my opinion, should be largely ignored. If a nation meets its goals in an equitable and ecologically sustainable way, and GDP rises slightly, so be it. If it falls slightly, so be it. It's just a means to the end. If the, if, the, if the goals are our ends and we achieve them in a sustainable and equitable way, then it really doesn't matter what GDP is. If you're an impoverished country, then to meet your goals, it's likely that you'll need an increase in GDP. But if you're a wealthy country like Australia, chances are you don't need uh, an increase in GDP to meet some of your currently unmet goals. So what's the genuine progress indicator? The GPI is a macroeconomic indicator of economic welfare. And it overcomes not the production measuring deficiencies of GDP, because it, it's, it's, uh, it's more than an adequate indicator of, of production of goods and services, but overcomes the welfare indicating deficiencies of GDP uh, by measuring the contribution that a nation's economic activity, not everything, but economic activity, uh, both formal and informal, makes to its economic welfare. And it does this uh, quite simply by estimating the major benefits and costs of economic activity. And by benefits and costs, I mean benefits and costs of the economic, social and environmental variety. Uh, the costs of economic activity are added and they're just then subtracted from the sum of the benefits to basically arrive at a measure of net benefit. That's all the GPI really is, it's a measure of net benefit. The GPI is not a comprehensive measure of human well-being. So if you see GPI results, don't think that's meant to represent every aspect of our well-being. Right? It's, it's, it's uh, indicating the economic welfare contribution of economic activity. As I said, ec economic activity is not the only thing that contributes towards our well-being overall. So there are many aspects related to our well-being that are independent of economic activity and these aspects are best reflected by other indicators. So clearly we need a suite of indicators of which the GPI might be one of them. Uh, just some of the benefit and cost items included in the GPI. Uh, now you may or may not have seen uh, so-called green measures of GDP. They are very different. They start with GDP and then there's subtractions, additions and, and so forth. The GPI in fact starts with consumption. So household consumption, private sector consumption. Uh, then there's an accounting adjustment for the reasons that I mentioned uh, earlier on as, as to why the uh, GDP is, is an inadequate measure of economic welfare. So household consumption expenditure, current expenditure on consumer durables is subtracted because it's assumed that you only start to enjoy the benefits of consumer durables in future years. Okay, so you subtract uh, current expenditure on consumer durables and assume that is just simply uh, a means of uh, adding to the stock of consumer durables. But what you add is an imputed value for the existing stock of consumer durables. So the value of consumer durables are not ignored. Okay, the existing stock, you impute a, a welfare benefit or value for the existing stock so it's the value of the existing stock that's added to the GPI. It's current expenditure on new consumer durables, which is not, because that's just adding to the stock. And, we, and to make it easier, or to make this or simple to some extent, uh, all current expenditure on consumer durables. Okay, we're talking about a year. If you buy a television set on the first day of the financial year, it's usually calculated over fi financial year, you start enjoying the benefits over that year. Just to make it uh, simple in terms of uh, the measurement of, uh, of this particular item, uh, all current expenditure on consumer durables is subtracted from household consumption expenditure and the imputed service value of the existing stock is added. That's then, once we've made that adjustment, that's then uh, adjusted again uh, according to changes in the distribution of income. So if the, so the, the, there's a thing called a Gini coefficient, which is a, uh, gives an indication of the distribution of income within a nation, uh, 
uh, if the Gini in, uh, coefficient rises, which means there's a growing gap between rich and poor, then the welfare contribution of consumption is reduced. Um, it's weighed downwards. If there's a narrowing gap between rich and poor, then that welfare contribution is increased, so it's weighed upwards. Uh, then there's an item for government consumption expenditure. So not all consumption expenditure is private sector consumption. It's, there's also government uh, sector consumption. Uh, that is not weighted by uh, an index of the distribution of income on the basis that it's assumed that your access to government consumption expenditure has nothing to do with your income, whereas, of course, your private consumption expenditure is. Uh, then uh, there's a, an item measuring the services from the existing stock of infrastructure. Uh, then uh, also added the value of unpaid household labour, which is enormous, which is not included in the GDP, it's included in the GPI. And this is important not only because, obviously, unpaid household labour adds to our economic welfare, but one of the other interesting things, uh, I've done a sort of basic calculation, that over the last 50 years, around about 20 to 25 per cent of the growth in Australia's GDP has been the result of nothing more than economic activity shifting from the informal to the formal economy. So close to a quarter of the so-called increase in economic activity over the last 50 years is not an increase in economic activity. It's just a shift in economic activity from one part of the economy, which is not captured by natural, national accounts, to one other part of the economy where it is. Of course, you get that shift, GDP goes up, because you uh, have an item here uh, capturing the value of unpaid household labour. It means that if economic activity shifts from the informal part of the economy to the formal part of the economy, the GPI doesn't change. Unle unless, of course, if uh, meals cooked at home aren't cooked as well as they are at a restaurant and you pay more at a restaurant, so the value of a restaurant meal uh, works out to be more than the value, the imputed value of a meal cooked at home, then I guess the GDP goes up a bit. And so there's some additional benefit, a qualitative benefit as a result. But basically, any shift of economic activity from the informal to the formal sector does not change the GPI because there's no increase in economic activity and there's no increase in the economic welfare of society. Um, there's an item f uh, for the value of the shadow economy, of course, excluding household labour. So household labour, would, you could argue, is part of the shadow economy, but I like to separate that so you get an idea of what the value of household labour is. Uh, then there's the cost of unemployment and underemployment, which is sub subtracted, so you can see there's a negative sign. So now I'm up to the cost, some of the social costs. Cost of crime, cost of overwork. Uh, I never used to put overwork in my GPI calculations. Uh, when I came to do this, and I was doing this for every country, I thought, I'm going to do this for every country on Earth. I happened to be in the USA for a conference, and I'm not trying to denigrate the, the USA, but uh, the USA at the time, in, in recent times, has had a, uh, an unemployment rate lower than Australia. So in terms of that social cost, it would appear that the USA is doing better than Australia. But I got into a taxi one day, and as you do, you get into conversation with the taxi driver, and then it seems that every time I get into a taxi and have a conversation with a taxi driver in the USA, the taxi driver tells me that he or she and partner and what have you have two or three jobs. Right? There's less labour underutilisation in the USA, but they work longer, they have more jobs, uh, and a lot of these people are in their 50s and 60s. Not many people in Australia in their 50s and 60s have two or three jobs. So there's an additional cost there. They're working longer than they'd like to work uh, because they need to have that second or third job to put the food on the table to pay the bills, which you don't have to do so much in Australia because we have a higher minimum wage. Uh, and then there's the environmental cost, the cost of non-renewable resource depletion, cost of land degradation, deforestation, cost of excessive water use, air pollution and CO2 emissions. Oh, they're just some of the benefit and cost items. It's about 20 to 20, oh, I can't remember exactly, it's somewhere between about 20 to 25 benefit and cost items that make up the GPI. Now let me just say a 
How are we going for time? Just a couple of things about the, the GPI. Uh, you have to be very careful that you don't double count when you're calculating the GPI. Uh, for example, the cost of unemployment. Uh, one of the costs of unemployment is the loss of real output and the subsequent loss of consumption. Now, if I was to put or we'll include in the cost of unemployment item the loss of consumption when I've already got an item for consumption which will be lower than it would otherwise be because of higher unemployment, I'd be double counting. All right. So, uh, the cost of unemployment item is confined to the psychological impact of unemployment, uh, which many studies have shown is significant and, and highly damaging. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not counting all the costs of unemployment, they're just being reflected in other items, that's all. Uh, and this next point is sort of related to what I've just said. Why are some items not included in the GPI? Okay, I, I talk about the GPI and sometimes people come up to me and they say, well, you know, of your items, why don't you have an item for this? And one of them uh, that I quite often get is the cost of corruption. You know, in some countries, that affects people's well-being or economic welfare quite significantly. Why don't I have a, an item for the cost of corruption? Well, if you think about corruption, it reduces a nation's productive capacity. It's a form of crime in itself. Remember one of the items, the social cost items, was the cost of crime, and often involves the approval of environmentally damaging activities. Well, I've got all these items for environmental costs. So the undesirable side effects of corruption are reflected in reduced consumption, my household consumption item, the increased cost of crime in my cost of, uh, of crime item and rising environmental costs. And they're all captured by other GPI items. So if I had a separate item for corruption, I'd be double counting again. So that's why you don't have... So that's not that you're not in, uh, including or taking account of the cost of corruption. It's just been reflected in the items that already make up the GPI. OK, now for some results. Um, here is uh, the... Well, the red line is Australia's per capita GDP. Uh, but by the way, this is for the period 1970 to 2016. Uh, and as you can see, uh, quite typically, per capita GDP rises in most years. There's the odd little period where you have a GDP recession, such as the early 1990s. Uh, Australia sort of... And, and of course, there was the period early 1980s. Uh, and, of course, around the time of the global financial crisis, well, Australia sort of avoided the, the worst of that, so it sort of flattened out a bit. So, overall, it basically uh, increased, whereas the per capita GPI, well, over the entire study period, it did go up, but not nearly at, at the same rate and the same magnitude as per capita GDP. Now, you might ask, why was the per capita GPI higher than per capita GDP? That's the blue line, than the per capita GDP in 1970. Uh, this is quite typical, that uh, if you go back far enough for any country, uh, what you'll find is at some point in time, the per capita GDPI is greater than per capita GDP, and that's because of the value of the informal economy. Okay. Um, and in fact, that, that's another interesting point about the per capita GDPI. I believe if, that if you know, once I calculate the GPI for every country, I will find that even the most impoverished country will probably have a per capita GPI value of around about $3,000 per person. Now, you quite often hear about how uh, a particular country, 30% of the population live on $1 a day or less. That's not true. That $1 represents the dollar of goods and services that they may purchase over time in the formal part of the economy. For very impoverished countries, a lot of people rely upon the informal part of the economy. So they may, may be living on $10 a day, but the $9 is the informal part of the economy that doesn't get captured by the national accounts, is not included in GDP. So whereas most people think that the informal economy sits on top of the formal economy, it's in fact the other way around. Really, we start off with the informal and the formal sits on top of that. Of course, as you... Uh, be uh, more in, uh, and more industrialised and your GDP rises, there typically is a transition of economic activity from the in informal to the formal part of the economy and it's at some point in time you get the crossover where the GDP starts to exceed the value of the GPI. Um, okay, so what have I got here? 
the black line is again Australia's per capita GPI. Those items that I had in that table, or some of the items that uh, I include in the uh, calculation of the GPI, I put into the three categories. I've got uh, uh, per capita economic benefits, I have per capita social net benefits, which is basically the, the value of unpaid household labour less the social costs, and then the green line represents the uh, uh, per capita environmental costs. You can see that the per capita economic benefits uh, went up uh, pretty much uh, for every year over the study period. The per capita social net benefits fell to some extent. It, now, there are periods where there's a, a bit of a downturn. That's usually the result of unemployment. When unemployment rises, uh, that tends to have an impact on per capita social net benefits. And of course, there's been a steady increase, being a negative value, being a, a, a all costs, a uh, steady increase in the per capita value of environmental costs. Uh, now, this is what I also, I also aim to do with uh, these particular studies. It's the first time this has been done with a GPI study. You can divide uh, the population of a nation up into uh, income groups, so quintiles, we're talking about the top 20%, the second 20%, the middle 20% in terms of income, uh, second bottom and bottom. So what I've got here, you can just see hiding behind the red line, a black line there, that's the per capita GPI of Australia, and those other lines are the per person GPI of the, of, uh, the uh, five income quintiles. And you can see that uh, there's been a massive increase in the difference between the top quintile and the bottom quintile, the per person uh, GPI. The other interesting thing too, if you, if you look at the, uh, the bottom quintile, you can see how vulnerable the bottom quintile is to economic shocks. And in fact, there was quite a significant decrease in the per person GPI of the bottom quintile in the 1970s into the 1980s, because that's when starting at 1970, that's basically when we had full employment and the dramatic decrease is because those who suffered most from the rise in unemployment in the 1970s was the bottom quintile. All right, so uh, results for Australia, 1970 to 2016, this just sums it up. So uh, we've got per capita GDP, basically more than doubled over the study period. It was 20,759 international dollars, I won't go into any great explanation as to what internet, it's where you, it's a fictitious uh, monetary unit based on uh, purchasing power parity, uh, which I need to do to do proper international comparisons. Uh, you can see that it dub more than doubled, it went from 20,000 to about 44,000 over the study period. The per capita GPI went from uh, about 22,500 to 29, well, nearly 30,000. It was only a 30.4% rise over the study period compared to a 114% rise in per capita uh, uh, GDP. Uh, per capita economic benefits more than doubled, 103.9% increase. Per capita social net benefits fell by around about 15%, and the per capita environmental costs uh, more than, well, almost uh, trebled over the, the study period. And then I've got the values from 1970 to 2016 of the, uh, the five uh, income quintiles. I've just highlighted the top and bottom. Uh, you can see that there's been quite a significant increase in the per person GPI uh, of the top quintile over the study period. The uh, bottom quintile, only a very, very small increase over the study. It's virtually the same as it was, only a 6% increase over the over the study period, whereas it was about a 42% increase for the top income quintile. Uh, if we compare 1970 to 2016, the, the fact of difference between top and bottom, you can see that uh, in 1970, uh, the top quintile was 54, the per person GPI was 54% higher than the bottom quintile, but was double, a little bit more than double, 107% higher by 2016. Well, this is the, and I can see Stephanie over here, and uh, uh, she'd be quite interested in this one here. It, it's very similar, the trend change in the, the per capita GDP and uh, per capita GPI, for, this is for the USA. Um, and, uh, well, perhaps I've only got a little bit of time. Uh, that's for Japan, uh, which is quite interesting because uh, 
Japan has been considered a bit of a basket case in recent years, but I think someone mentioned in one of the presentations that it's not a basket case at all. Uh, its per capita GDP hasn't risen much in recent times, but um, its per capita GPI, uh, it too, you could argue, hasn't, or certainly hasn't risen at the same rate as per capita GDP. But as you'll soon see, uh, in fact, I'll put the, the, uh, the per capita GDP and per capita GPI of China first. Uh, of the countries that I've done so far, where I'm very happy with what I've done, uh, Japan has the highest per capita GPI, slightly higher than Australia, which is slightly higher than the USA in 2016. But anyway, so that's, that, of course, you can see the sharp increase in the per capita GDP of China. That's the massive increase in the level of economic activity since around about 1990. Uh, and you can see the, the, the quite significant difference between the per capita GPI and per capita GDP back in 1970 when the informal part of the Chinese economy was very large relative to the formal economy. So overall, uh, I'll just focus on the per capita GPI and per capita GDP values. You can see that uh, Japan's per capita, so the red values, GDP, in, this is in 2016, so it's the last year of the study period, was around 38,000, Australia 44,000, the USA 53,000. Uh, yet, despite Japan having the uh, lower, of the three countries, the lowest per capita GDP, it had the highest per capita GPI. It's about 1,000, just over 1,000 per person more than Australia, 30,800 to 29,700 to the USA, 28,400. Uh, as for China, uh, its per capita GPI was about 10,000. The interesting thing about China is that its per capita economic benefits are much lower than they are for Australia, Japan and the USA. Its ecological costs, per capita ecological costs, are also lower. But given that it's got a much lower per capita GDP, it turns out that per dollar of GDP, China's ecological costs are twice that of USA, of the USA and Australia. Indicating, in my opinion, that China is a global spillover cost epicenter. If you want to produce something and it involves dirty production, you send it to China. They'll accept it, they'll produce it, and they'll bear the environmental cost on behalf of countries like Australia and the USA. The other interesting thing, too, is that the increasing per capita... So we've seen that the, the per capita GPI has increased over the study period, not nearly as dramatically as per capita GDP, but the increase is largely the result of rising benefits per dollar of GDP and declining costs per dollar of GDP. Now, the declining cost is because we are, in fact, using fewer resources to produce a dollar's worth of GDP. So even though environmental costs are going up, you've got to remember that GDP is rising at the same time. But it does mean that the rise in the per capita GPI for countries like the USA and Australia has had little to do, or less to do, with the increase in its GDP, which is growth, as Herman Daly talked about it yesterday, and more to do with development, qualitative improvement. And to demonstrate my point, what I've actually been able to do is I put some of the benefit, and uh, I, I can't go into an explanation into what I call uncancelled benefits, uncancelled costs, but just imagine we've got all the benefits uh, and we've got all the costs, and I've got a curve to represent what the benefits might be at a particular point in time for different levels of, of GDP. So on the horizontal axis, I've got total GDP, I've got uh, the benefits and the costs and the uh, GPI value, not the per capita GPI, but the GPI value on the vertical axis. And you can see we've got uh, a benefit and a cost curve. So I've selected various years between 1970 and 2016. And you can see that the gap between the two curves uh, at a particular GDP in each of these years has grown because the GPI has increased. Uh, that increase in G the GPI has more to do with the widening of the gap between the benefit and the cost curve than it has to do with the rise in GDP. In fact, throughout the entire study period, the I don't, I don't want to use technical sort of terms because I know people uh, don't have a strong understanding of economics, but throughout the entire study period, the marginal benefit of GDP growth for the USA was less than the marginal cost. So, in other words, it meant that if there was no shift in these curves over the study period. The USA just increased its GDP, its GPI would be lower. 
than what it, in 2016 than what it was in 1970. It would be lower. So the main thing that's caused the increase in the GPI is the shift in the curve, which is development rather, or more so than growth. And the same thing with Australia and Japan. Uh, okay, I don't really have much time, do I? Um, okay, so what shall I do? Uh, I think I'm just going to leave it there. I was going to talk a little bit about the ecological uh, footprint and combine it with the GPI. Oh, what? Oh, oh. Mm. Okay. I will just say a couple of things. The, the ecological, so this is just an economic indicator. We're also interested in how it's sustainable, whether the economic act, level of economic activity is sustainable. Uh, and we need an ecological indicator for that. Now, there are various e ecological indicators, and you know, there's a lot of criticism directed towards uh, the, the, the ecological indicators that exist. But one of the popular indicators is a thing called an ecological footprint. And the ecological footprint uh, represents the area of land, and the key word here is that's required the area of land that's required to generate the resources, to absorb the waste and provide the critical ecosystem services needed to sustain economic activity at its current level. That's what it measures. So basically the ecological footprint represents a nation's demands on its natural capital. Then we've got a thing called biocapacity. Biocapacity is indicated by the quantity of land that's available. Remember the ecological footprint is what's required, that's the demand by capacity what's available to generate an ongoing supply of resources, absorb waste and maintain critical ecosystem services. Uh, so uh, the by capacity re reflects ecologically sustainable resource supplies. So if your footprint is greater than the by capacity, you've got an ecological deficit. It means that the resources that are required to maintain your economy cannot be sustained in the long run. You basically have, have an economy that's grown beyond its maximum sustainable scale. Uh, in the case of uh, Australia, believe it or not, I know uh, John uh, mentioned something about the ecological footprint before, but it is due to the fact that Australia, and we, Australia has a very, very high per capita ecological footprint, but we do have an ecological footprint which is measured or ref, uh, represented by the sort of orangey-brown line there and the biocapacity, uh, the green line. We do have an ecological footprint in Australia. According to this, I'm not, I'm not an expert in calculating, I don't do the calculation of the ecological footprint or the biocapacity, but according to uh, the Global Footprint Network, which does all these calculations, Australia has an ecological surplus. And it's due, not be, we do have a very, very high per capita ecological footprint, but we have a small population. So you, and, it, and it's the total impact, the ecological footprint, of course, is per capita footprint times population. So we do have an ecological surplus. The USA has an ecological deficit. Most countries have an ecological deficit. Uh, so you can also convert the biocapacity to one Australia. That, that black dotted line now means one Australia. Uh, so we've, we're not using, we're using, really only using, according to these figures, half a, uh, a, a, a continent. So we're... we're, we're a, but... But globally, globally, yeah, you've only got one. Globally, if this is the really important one. Uh, here we've got the black line, dotted line, represents one Earth. 1961 through to 2014, the red line is the global ecological footprint. And you can see that the global ecological footprint uh, surpassed the bio global biocapacity around about 1970. And it's now 70% larger than the biocapacity. So the global economy is about 70% larger than what can be sustained in the long run. Uh, now, vertical axis, this is going to be very quick. I've got ecological surplus, ecological deficit. If you're down this way, you've got an unsustainable economy. If you're up near the top, you've got a sustainable economy. On the horizontal axis, I've got per capita GPI. You want to be as far to the right as possible. That's the higher your per capita GPI. You want to be in that top right-hand corner because that means you're sustainable and you've got a high per capita GPI. And you want to be moving in that northeasterly direction. What's happened to Australia over the study period, uh, you can see so Australia's been moving in a southeasterly direction. If we keep going in that direction, we will go to a point where we go into unsustainable. Uh, we have had a 
bit of a rise in the per capita GPI, so it's an easterly shift, but it's more south southerly, and that's, that's the concern from a sustainability perspective. The USA, as I said, it's throughout the entire study period, it had an uh, ecological footprint in excess of its uh, biocapacity. So it's basically been just moving in an easterly direction, but it is below the horizontal axis, so you could argue that the uh, US economy has grown beyond its maximum sustainable scale. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Sorry, how did I go? That's not too bad. Could I'm start, sure maybe? there are some questions. And here are my glamorous volunteers to come. Uh, there is, uh, there's, uh, couple of questions at the back, but maybe taking our advanced age into account, Paul could intercept a question en route and get to the back as well. Oh, let's go with, let's go with uh, Tuan first because he hasn't asked a question. Hi, Phil. So how, how do you account for the um, technical sort of, for lack of a better word, so the technical um, progress, if you like, you know, we're getting better at producing more using fewer resources. Mm -hmm. human. And that has been always the characteristic of the um, our human progress. So do you take that into account? Yes, yeah, I do take. Well, you, you saw that. So that was reflected by the upward shift of the benefit curve, which means basically we're producing better quality goods. Uh, and the shift down of the cost curve, which indicates that the environmental cost per dollar of GDP, for, so that was for the USA, has fallen. So that does reflect that technology, and that explains the rise, that's the main thing that explains the rise in the per capita GPI of the USA over the study period. So more so than, than the actual increase in GDP. Okay, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, I'm interested in, uh, at the risk of appearing to pile on the USA, but it's an interesting case example in my mind is healthcare in the USA because um, all, the, all the uninsured and even those who are insured um, you know, go broke if they fall ill. Yeah. Um, how are the various elements of um, lack of services and wasted services, for instance, if somebody can't afford an MRI, they pay for an X-ray and hope that it reveals something, and just going broke through being sick and even if you're insured, how is that all of that taken into account, okay. including the psychological effects of having that sort of Damocles over your head for right. your whole life. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so uh, costs on health, uh, s only a certain portion is counted as a benefit and uh, the remainder is counted as a defensive or re rehabilitative form of expenditure which just maintains our economic welfare rather than increases it, so it's not included in the GPI. Of course, it's included in the GDP because it's a sort of form of production. Uh, if a person goes broke, I guess that means that uh, they can't spend on, they don't have the income or the money to, to purchase goods and services, so it might have a, a, a negative effect on the consumption item. So that would bring the GPI down, perhaps into the future. Uh, so, yeah, certain things, so getting back to that double counting and why you have some items and you don't have others and so forth, a lot of things that you can think of uh, can be reflected in more than one of those items in various, various ways. Um, Could I, I might add that obviously some of the things about the GPI are subjective and not, there are lots of gaps in the statistics. But what Phil is calling on, really, is for national statistical agencies around the world to do a better job. This is not the end of history. This is a first step, the, the work that Phil is, is doing here on, on, on producing the GPI. Now, it's a sort of, what's, I can't think of the right word for it. What's that? My brain's not working. You know what I mean. Prototype. That's it. Something yeah. like that. Something for people to develop on. Once we get national mm. statistical agencies doing this kind of thing and putting serious resources behind them, then you have better and more comprehensive statistics and the way in which the mm. GPI is measured will yeah. evolve over time. Yeah, I could mention, uh, of course, to calculate these uh, items that make up the GPI, there's economic, social, environmental. 
The data for the economic items, particularly for countries like Australia and the USA, no problem whatsoever. Social, pretty average. Environmental, appalling. Which tells you something about our priorities. We sort of put greater priorities on the economic, a bit less on the social, and we don't really seem to care about the environmental. The environmental 